Starting with a personal disclosure, I have to admit, this has been the most terrifying experience of my life. It all began innocently enough I was browsing Craigslist in search of a new TV, stumbling upon a listing for a 55-inch smart TV priced at a mere $150 I couldn't resist. I reached out to the seller, expressing my keen interest. To my delight, he confirmed its availability and invited me over to inspect it. He even suggested a visit later that night. Despite the distance, I decided to go for it, driven by my desire for the TV. Accompanied by my friend Mason, I set off, albeit with some reservations about the journey's length. Mason, although with me, opted to stay in the car, which, though of limited practical help, provided me with a sense of security. Upon arrival, I knocked on the door, and the seller greeted me promptly, wearing a friendly smile. Engaging in pleasantries, he welcomed me inside to view the TV. As we conversed, he curiously inquired if I had come alone, to which I replied in the negative, masking the truth about Mason's presence. The seller's odd question lingered in my mind, but I brushed it off, attributing it to nerves in the late hour. Engaged in casual conversation, I suddenly heard faint, muffled yelling, seemingly originating from elsewhere in the house. When I queried its source, the seller casually dismissed it as his sons playing in their room. Yet something about his response felt off. Despite my growing unease, I reassured him of my well-being, eager to proceed with the TV inspection. Sensing my tension, he suggested we move to the basement for a quicker setup demonstration. Descending the stairs, I felt a twinge of discomfort, but I rationalized it as paranoia. Yet, as I took the first step, the seller abruptly shoved me, sending me tumbling down the stairs. Miraculously avoiding serious injury, I found myself at the bottom, struggling to rise. To my horror, the seller loomed over me, wielding a crowbar without a word. Instinctively, I dodged his swing and retaliated, incapacitating him momentarily. Seizing the opportunity, I fled upstairs, screaming for help in Mason's name. As I raced away, cries for help echoed from the basement, chilling me to the core. Despite the urge to investigate further, self-preservation prevailed, and I fled the scene. With trembling hands, I recounted the ordeal to Mason, grappling with the shock and fear. Summoning the authorities, we returned to the house, where police swiftly arrived. They apprehended the seller, revealing his nefarious deeds a history of violence and imprisonment awaited him. Shocked and shaken, I sought solace in therapy and medication, grappling with the trauma that haunts me daily. Each day is a struggle, but I cling to hope, determined to overcome the darkness that envelops me. I used to engage in a profitable side hustle, buying items like iPhones, video game systems, and TVs on Facebook Marketplace, then reselling them on Craigslist and Facebook for a tidy profit. This had been my practice for years, and I had garnered valuable experience along the way. iPhones were my primary focus due to their high profit margins. On one occasion I acquired an iPhone X for just $155, a steal considering its market value at the time, over a year ago. Listing the iPhone X for $300, with a note indicating willingness to entertain the best offer, I anticipated a quick sale, given the demand for such devices. Within an hour, I received an inquiry from a potential buyer, expressing interest in the phone. After a brief exchange of messages, we arranged to meet the next day, late afternoon, following her work hours. However, shortly before our scheduled meeting, she requested that I come to her house instead of meeting at the agreed-upon location. Despite my initial apprehension, I agreed, as her offer matched my asking price, and the distance was manageable. Arriving at her residence around 7.20 p.m., I felt a surge of anxiety as I awaited a response at her doorstep, the encroaching darkness adding to my unease. Upon her greeting, she introduced herself as Sabrina and ushered me inside to meet her husband, who was lounging in the living room. Almost immediately, their demeanor took a sour turn, with veiled jabs at my appearance and attire. Sensing an underlying hostility, I grew wary of their intentions. Sabrina's behavior, in particular, seemed erratic, hinting at possible substance abuse. Despite the tense atmosphere, I presented the iPhone for inspection. Sabrina insisted on testing it with her SIM card, only to express dissatisfaction over a minor crack, 
clearly visible in the listing. Her accusations of deception and attempts to haggle intensified my discomfort. Refusing to budge from my price of $250, tensions reached a breaking point when Sabrina hurled the phone at me, causing it to shatter upon impact. Shocked and angered by her actions, I confronted her, while her husband attempted to defuse the situation with a partial refund. Though tempted to involve the authorities, I ultimately accepted the reimbursement, eager to extricate myself from the ordeal. Reflecting on the incident, I resolved never to conduct such transactions outside secure locations like police stations, prioritizing safety over convenience. One day, out of sheer boredom, I found myself idly browsing Craigslist. I didn't have any specific items in mind, and at that time I was oblivious to the fact that people used Craigslist for dating or meeting new people. But after a bit of exploration, I discovered that it was indeed a common practice. Feeling both bored and lonely, I perused the listings and stumbled upon a profile belonging to a guy named Tom, who claimed to be 32 years old. Given that I was 34 at the time, we were roughly the same age. I wasn't actively seeking anything specific. I'm generally laid back and open to whatever unfolds. Tom had an appealing vibe and he seemed genuine. Moreover, he wasn't overly attractive, so I didn't fret about the possibility of encountering a catfish. His bio resonated with me as we appeared to share similar interests. Thus, I decided to give it a shot. We began conversing and before long, he obtained my phone number. The fact that he lived less than 10 minutes away was an added bonus. He proposed going out to a nearby bar that weekend, and I agreed. Our conversations quickly progressed from friendly banter to flirtatious exchanges. On our first date at the bar, things seemed to be going well. We engaged in small talk, indulged in drinks and food, and had an enjoyable time. I found myself developing feelings for him, However, as the night wore on and we were preparing to leave, I received a text from an unknown number warning me to stay away from her man confused. I showed Tom the message, but he brushed it off, feigning ignorance. His demeanor grew increasingly awkward and suspicious, indicating a desire to leave promptly. Just before we parted ways, his girlfriend unexpectedly arrived on the scene. Yes, you heard that right, his girlfriend. I was stunned and outraged. Fooled by alcohol and emotions, I confronted the woman unabashedly. She erupted into a tirade, hurling insults and physical attacks my way. In the ensuing chaos, she assaulted me with her purse, punched me, and pulled my hair, leaving me reeling. I attempted to defend myself, but I ended up falling and hitting my head on the concrete, prompting a trip to the hospital due to near fainting. Reflecting on that disastrous night, I'm still incredulous that I found myself in such a predicament. It was completely out of character for me, as I'm typically reserved and respectful. I remain uncertain how the girlfriend discovered our rendezvous or even knew we were together at the bar. Nonetheless, I'm grateful that she intervened before I became further entangled in a potentially damaging situation. She was apprehended and charged with assault that night while I emerged without legal repercussions, albeit with a severe concussion. That harrowing experience served as a stark reminder of the dangers inherent in meeting strangers online. I've since found happiness with my fiancé, with whom I've been in a relationship for over five years. We're set to tie the knot next year and are eager to embark on our journey together, including starting a family. It's a cautionary tale I share to underscore the risks of internet encounters you never truly know someone's intentions. Things could have taken a far graver turn that fateful night. About two years ago, my buddy got his own apartment. However, the sofa in it was all worn out, so he decided it was time for an upgrade. Since my dad had a van, he asked me to help find a new sofa and use the van for transport. Next day, we checked Craigslist to see what sofas others were selling. We found an ad that said, free cream leather sofa for three people. It's in great shape. And first person to see it gets it for free. There was also a picture and the sofa seemed really nice, but the ad had been there for about a week. So we wondered if it was still available or if someone had already taken it and they just didn't remove the ad yet. My friend messaged the person selling the sofa. 
and they replied really quickly, saying the sofa was still there, ready for us to pick up any time. I couldn't help but feel a bit weird. I mean, a free sofa in perfect condition had been sitting there for a whole week, and no one had taken it. So we thought maybe there was a problem with it, something not shown in the pictures. It was the weekend, and we didn't have anything to do. So we thought, why not go see the sofa? My friend messaged the person selling it, and they picked a time and place to meet the parking lot of a nearby McDonald's at around 9 p.m. The seller said he'd be at work until 8 p.m. and needed time to get ready afterward. They described their vehicle as a green Honda Accord with a trailer. We arrived at the McDonald's parking lot around 8.50 p.m. Since there were many people there, we didn't feel worried about our safety. My friend got a text saying the seller was about 15 minutes away. The seller wanted to know what our van looked like, so my friend described it to him. After my friend messaged the seller about our van, it took about five minutes. Then this man came up. He looked a bit heavy, maybe around 50 years old, with messy gray hair and a scruffy gray beard, a plain white shirt with food stains, black jeans that had holes and dried mud stains, and black boots with steel toes that were also covered in dry mud. He made his way to my side of the van since I was the one driving. He knocked on my window, so I rolled it down a bit to talk to him. You guys here for the sofa, he asked, his voice sounding like he had a cough he couldn't get out. Yeah, I replied. Rob's car broke down nearby and his phone died. I walked up here to let you know. He's with the car waiting for help from AA. But if you want, you can go down there and pick up the sofa directly from him. My friend and I just looked at each other, feeling unsure about what was happening. Can I hop in the van with you guys, he asked. And we'll go back to Rob together. How far is he down the road, I asked. Not too far. But I need to show you where to go, he said. Right then, my friend pretended to get a phone call. Hello? Yes? Oh, no way, really. We'll be right there, he said, turning to me. Hey, we need to go. My dad's got a flat tire and he's stuck on the side of the road. I nodded, understanding it was a made-up call. Just an excuse to get away from the strange guy. We have to leave right now. But we'll talk to you tomorrow about the sofa, I said to the guy, who just kept staring at me as I rolled up my window and started driving. Dude, that was creepy as hell, my friend said. Yeah, definitely, I replied. After deciding to drive around the back of the parking lot to make sure everything was okay, we saw him still standing in the same place. We left him talking on the phone. He put his phone down, and after about two minutes, a car pulled up with three men inside, and he got in. Right then, my friend's phone started ringing. Hey, can we meet up tomorrow? I can keep the sofa for you until then if you need, he said on the phone. While he was talking, I saw one of the guys in the car that took the strange guy away, also talking on the phone. My friend told Rob that he would call him tomorrow because he was busy and couldn't talk right now. Right when my friend ended the call, the guy in the car finished his call too. I told my friend that there might not have been a broken down car and the creepy guy might have just tried to get us to go somewhere so the guys in the car could do who knows what to us. We never got any calls from them again. We also reported the AD and it got taken down the next day. I grew up in Montana with my mom, dad, and sister. We went to school in the States and both got average grades. Our parents worked in real estate, so we moved to better houses about four times that I remember. But the good thing was that they always stayed in the same area, so we didn't have to switch schools and leave our friends. That was what I worried about the most. When my sister turned 19, she got a job with a company that plans vacations. I felt happy for her, but I jokingly told her, thanks for leaving me here without our parents teaming up against me. She just laughed and said, now you've got to handle your own challenges. About six months after my sister went to Europe for work, I finally decided to get up and find some kind of job. I talked to my dad about starting my own dog walking business. He thought I was a bit crazy for dealing with lots of different dogs every day, but he did support me and agreed to help. We got some special clothes with our business name and even a van with our logo on the outside. Next, we made a website. My dad also had an idea. Since the dog walking job would be flexible, he suggested I search on Craigslist or Facebook for people looking for dog walkers. That way I could reach out to potential clients who already needed the service. 
At first, I only found people on the other side of Montana or in the next state, which wasn't practical due to travel expenses and time. Eventually, I saw an ad looking for a dog walker to walk a German Shepherd six days a week around noon. The lady told me the dog's name was Ben, a five-year-old male with a friendly personality. I asked if I could meet Ben first to see if we got along. The lady, who introduced herself as Jane, thought it was a good idea. I shared my name and a quick introduction during our phone call. I mentioned that I was excited to visit and meet the dog. On Friday morning, the drive took about 40 minutes. Even though it's still quite a distance, she was offering a good pay rate and it was a daily job. I could tell the house was really fancy because of the big walls and gates. The gates were closed when I got there, uh, but I saw there was a button on the wall for calling. I drove up, got out, and pressed the button. Can I help you, sir? A voice said. Then I saw a camera on top of one of the pillars watching me. Hello, good morning. I'm Liam. I have an appointment with a lady named Jane about a dog, I replied. Sure, wait a moment. I'll go check the voice responded. After about three minutes, the voice came back and said, yep, everything's fine. The gates will open in a bit. Just step back a bit. Once they open, drive up to the house and park on the left side. Then stay in your car until someone comes to get you. That seemed a bit odd. Anyway, the gates opened slowly and I drove up the long driveway. It had palm trees and green areas on both sides. The house looked like Spanish style with a pretty colorful slate tile roof and there were plants growing on pillars near the dark wood double front door. By the front door, there was a man wearing black pants and a black polo shirt. That's when I saw two Dobermans, black and tan with red collars, running alongside my station wagon. This whole thing feels like a James Bond movie set. Security guards, a guy at the front door, what's next? I wondered. I parked on the left as I was told. When I stopped the car, the one dog sat by my driver's door and just stared at me. The other dog stood at the front, also just watching me. Next, I noticed the guy from the front doorstep. He came forward and whistled, and both dogs ran to him and sat down on the porch. Another guy came out of the front door and shouted. Then he told me to get out and say hello. I followed the instructions, but I kept an eye on the dogs. As I walked up onto the porch toward the front door, the dogs followed me closely. I saw the man standing there with them, smiling as I approached. Don't worry, they're friendly unless you stare at them, he said. I went inside through the front door, and the man closed it behind me. Inside, I noticed other guys wearing the same black pants and polo shirts as the man with the dogs on the porch. And I saw a big well-kept garden with a large swimming pool surrounded by sun loungers. In the pool, a woman was swimming. At first, the I didn't see anyone else. But then I noticed the German Shepherd dog sitting by a sun lounger at the back. The dog was looking at me. The lady in the pool stopped swimming and looked up saying, thanks, Riley. Appreciate it. I guess Riley was the guy in the black polo. She got out of the pool using the steps and I saw a woman in her mid thirties in a black one piece swimsuit. She was quite good looking. So I started to feel a bit embarrassed. She smiled at me and said, thanks Liam. I'm Jane. This has been, she snapped her fingers and Ben walked over to her. Now he's friendly. Unlike those two outside. I guess you kind of met them when you came in. Yeah, I did. I'm sure they're great at their job. Come on, meet Ben, she said. I went over and Ben wagged his tail. He seemed to enjoy the attention and was happy. Well, if you work for me and my family, I need you to be really loyal and keep things private. In return, you'll get good pay and some extra perks. Oh, and one more thing. Have you ever used a gun, she asked, as she bent down and took out a handgun from a big, big bag by the seat beside her. She put the gun on the table next to the pool. Well, I did some target shooting with my dad a couple of times last summer, but that's all. And I don't carry a gun, if that's what you're asking, I replied. She looked at me seriously and said, Liam, pick up the gun and shoot at that plant pod over there. She pointed to a pot about 40 feet away on the edge of a wall. Don't worry. There's nothing to worry about. If you miss Jane, I just came to meet you and Ben to talk about walking him, not to start shooting guns in your yard. It seems a bit weird to me, I explained. 
I know it might sound odd, Liam. You see, if you walk Ben, and some people find out we're wealthy, Ben is a high-quality German Shepherd, and he's also used as a selective stunt dog. He has a very high value, so if someone tries to take him, I want the person walking Ben to be able to keep them safe. So you're saying I should be ready to shoot or have a fight with someone if needed, I asked. She looked at me and said, Yes, that's right. And that's why I'm offering you such a high pay. Thanks for the job offer, but I don't want to take that kind of risk just for walking a dog, I replied. After that, Riley escorted me out of the property. All of this happened last year. But you know what is the disturbing part in this? Just last week, I saw on the news that some people tried to kidnap a dog from a dog walker. And during the struggle, the person walking the dog in the park got into a fight and is now in the hospital. When I saw the news, I investigated and found out it was the same lady's dog. I had refused to walk. When I was 17, I was looking to buy my first car. I was on Craigslist every single day, searching for a beater car that could get me from point A to point B. My budget was $3,000 at most, so the cars I was looking at were no newer than 2004. One day, I found an ad for a 2002 two-door Honda Accord listed for $2,000 with mileage under $80,000. Right away, I knew I wanted to check it out. I convinced my mom to drive me to view the car after conversing with the guy over the phone. Originally, I texted him asking for details, but he ended up calling me. He sounded basically normal over the phone, rather polite. He answered some questions I had about the car and whatnot. And when he asked for my name, and I told him dad, he said, dad, what a great name. That's my name, so I left, because it was the polite thing to do. But I just found it to be such an odd comment. Like everything about it, it almost sounded like he forgot his name was dad because of the pause between what a great name and that's my name, it just sounded sketchy. Nevertheless, everything else about the call went fine. So the next day my mom drove me to the address the guy gave me. We got off the highway and onto the streets right away. We agreed this was a trashy looking neighborhood with bars on windows and graffiti under bridges. I was hoping the guy's place wouldn't seem equally sketchy, but as we pulled up it was. It wasn't a standard property like the rest of the area. The entrance to the property was between two houses, not a driveway, just some low-key road that led into an inlet with two more houses. Every house was cramped between other houses and buildings. But there I saw it behind a cord, which was what you'd call the driveway for this house. My mom and I stepped up to the front door and rang the bell. We didn't know if it rang or not because we couldn't hear anything. So I knocked. One of the windows opened out of nowhere, and a man's voice said, come inside, the door's unlocked. My mom stopped me and whispered, are you sure you want to go in there? I said, yeah, I let ourselves in, expecting to be greeted by Dan. The inside of this place was kind of dark, not a lot of natural light came in through the minimal windows. Hello, I said. Yeah, over here a voice called. It was deeper than I heard on the phone. Dan, I asked. Yeah, he said. I began walking through the little kitchen closer to his voice. My mom grabbed my shoulder and stopped me. She whispered in my ear, we're leaving the man's voice now came from beyond this door at the end of the kitchen. He called, down here, we could do the transaction here. My mom and I left the house in a hurry. As we were hurrying to my car, a lady at the next building over called to us. She came hurrying down from her front porch, warning us not to go in there, asking why we were there. We explained that I came to buy a car, but that he was calling us into his basement. The woman said that she has been concerned about that man living next door for months, that she thinks he's up to no good, and that he constantly has random cars pull up in the driveway in the middle of the night. We asked if his name was Dan. She said she wasn't sure, but that she vaguely remembered the guy introducing himself as Mike. She told us to just get far away from the house immediately. And so we did. It's disturbing to know my mom and I may have been murdered in that basement if we went down there. Like how could we do a transaction before even viewing the car or agreeing on anything? Better question why in the basement. The whole thing screams trap. I don't know what else he could have wanted to do to us, more specifically me, in that basement. <laughs>